As stated, As stated, I am Michael Fuller. I am one of a few satellite liaisons in the U.S. where we are uh, where we are covering um, different upcoming satellites uh, from Gozar to JPSS. And my talk today is going to focus on the Joint Polar Satellite System and give you an idea of not only what's going on um, as, as far as the program status, but also how the U.S. is using the data and how we hope maybe the world may start to be able to use data as well. So again, if you've never heard of a satellite liaison, I know that uh, I had a colleague Amanda Turbor talked the other day. Actually, I'll wait a second here. I think, Kathy, I'm getting a lot of wind. There we go. <laughs> All right. So my colleague, I'm hoping everyone can still hear me. Um, my colleague, Amanda Turborg, gave a talk on Monday about Gozar. And so I'm giving the other side of the program perspective here with the Joint Polar System. All right. If you have questions as I'm giving the talk, uh, please feel free to put that in the chat. Uh, I will my best to answer on the fly. I, I kind of like the idea of a little more dialogue rather than me just um, preaching to you about what's going on in the satellite world. But if you want to wait till the end, that's fine as well. So I will move forward now. So why JPSS? Why do we need the Joint Polar Satellite System? Well, as you can see here by some of these examples, numerical weather prediction is probably one of the biggest uses when it comes to polar orbiting satellites. Uh, high resolution data is very hard to beat, and it really does help in, in tuning the forecasts, especially in the medium range of three to seven days, uh, to give you a better idea of, of what may be up and coming as far as your local weather. But also from the operational weather and environmental satellite observations, especially for polar regions, Alaska in particular uses polar orbiting data as opposed to geostationary because they're so far north. The geostationaries have so much parallax as you're on the limbs that the forecasters, you, know, you have to kind of turn your head to the side and wink if you will, so that you can actually make sense of what the geostationary might be showing. So polar orbiters being that they're directly overhead and up Alaska at those high latitudes, you're gonna get quite a few passes. Uh, it gives you a much better assessment of what's going on in your area. And then of course the global coverage and the unique day and night imaging. And day night band has been one of the biggest hits uh, here in the US as it's offering us a, a glimpse of visible quality imagery in the middle of the night. So we've seen some examples where a hurricane, for instance, uh, when one thought the center of, actually at this point it wasn't a hurricane, the center of the tropical storm was co-located with the deepest convection. In essence, the low level circulation ran away from the deep convection. And it was the day-night band, the timeliness of getting that day-night band image that helped the forecasters. So it's turned out that we, we're learning a lot of how we can better use polar orbiters, not just in numerical weather prediction, but also from a forecast perspective. So JPSS program supports all four of the key NOAA mission areas. As you can see here, the climate adept mitigation, the weather ready name, as well as the resilient coastal communities, economies, and the healthy oceans. So it's really offering up a plethora of products and techniques that can be used not just for weather, but even for monitoring um, other areas that NOAA supports as well. So the JPSS mission is proven to be very important. The first satellite in this series being the SUMI MPP, uh, which was originally supposed to be just used for research, has made its way into operations and gives us a glimpse of what the JPSS 1 and 2, which will be launched in a couple of years, will have to offer. So when you're looking at the JPSS instruments, and again, you can attribute 
um, or I'm sorry, you can also apply this to the SUMI NPP satellite as well. You have the ATMS, the Advanced Technology Microwave Sounder, and also the CRIS or Cross-Track Infrared Sounder for them being used for measuring water vapor information. I uh, also can be used for the microwave uh, technology of the ATMS if you're monitoring tropical cyclones, for instance. You have the VIRS in instrument, also known as the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, which gives us a, a, a glimpse of uh, the Earth when it comes to the raw imagery. You know, being able to identify uh, convective systems, smoke plumes, the aerosols, but also can be used as you can see listed there for uh, monitoring the ocean and the, the healthiness of the ocean. The OMPS or ozone mapping and profiler suite being used uh, quite a bit all of a sudden for monitoring not just the ozone, but also uh, stratospheric intrusions, something that I hold near and dear to my heart as uh, I work with the Ocean Prediction Center, which deals with explosive cytogenesis of the ocean, and the stratospheric intrusion is very important for that. And then we round it out with the Clouds and Earth Radiant Energy System, also known as Ceres, and the Radiation Budget Instrument, which will be on JPSS 2, 3, and 4. Um, Ceres is on SMPP and will be on the first JPSS. And that will support, you know, monitoring the Earth Radiation Budget. All right. So moving forward, the enhanced data products have really helped. As you can see the list here, I'm not going to go through every single one, but we will highlight you know, atmospheric temperature and moisture profiles, hurricane intensity, uh, volcanic ash, fire and smoke, vegetation greenness, and seas, ozone, oil spills. There are a lot of uses that we're seeing just with the first in the series of these satellites. So that makes it a, a very exciting um, you know, looking at the future makes it very exciting for us that we're going to have channel satellites of this caliber in the coming. So if you wanted a quick history, or you didn't want a quick history, I'm going to give it to you anyway. <laughs> the uh, Pose weather satellites go all the way back to the 1960s with Tyros and Asa. And then as you can see, we move forward into the 70s, and you started to see the first of the NOAA uh, polar orbiter satellites 6 through 14. And then today we have NOAA 15 through, I believe, 19, although it's not listed. Um, 18 for sure, I believe 19. If it's not there, um, then I might be wrong on that. But the SMPP satellite was the follow on to the NOAA birds. It's a joint NASA and NOAA satellite. And then JPSS 1 and 2 will follow beyond that as we go towards the year 2017. So I wanted to include for you a rollout schedule. Um, this is the latest I was able to find as it was approved by um, NESDIS. And as you can see here from our DOD satellite, Department of Defense, we have the DMSP. I don't know if you know what that is, but that is the, uh, the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program. We have DMSP-19 and DMSP-20, which is on the way. Uh, it's under review as here. And then we also do utilize the MEDOF satellites from UNETSAT. And to answer Bernie's question here on NOAA-19-AVHRR on MEDOF, I believe that's, that's correct. Uh, as far as the NOAA satellites are concerned, you have the SUMI MPP, which will most likely outlive what's what's seen here as the end of 2016. These satellites are pretty robust and tend to last longer than we expect. JPSS-1 will be launched about midway through 2017. JPSS-2 will follow along in 2021. And then the more exciting news was that JPSS-3 and JPSS-4 have been approved and can now be on the flyoff schedules. There might be some minor tweaks to the instrumentation. Um, one of the biggest complaints that we've had about VIRS, for instance, does not have water vapor capability. I believe the initial thought was that the water vapor would be available on the CRIS instrument, but it's degraded to about eight kilometer resolution. And VIRS, you know, if you're in the I-band, they're as good as 375 meter resolution 
or the M bands, which are closer to 750 meters. So if you want to combine the water vapor from Chris with say a Veer's image, you'd have to degrade the image all the way down to eight kilometers. So I believe that the program has heard the complaints from the forecasters and there is talk that maybe we'll get a water vapor, at least one water vapor band on JPS at three or four. So we're gonna keep our fingers crossed that that's a possibility. So when you're looking at, Bill Schoberg said, we are working on that, nice. So JPSS, uh, as far as the satellite looks like, if you were to have it in your the palm of hand, you can see here uh, the various instruments are located on the satellite itself. I just want to give you a visual representation of everything I've explained. And now I'm going to go into what we call our proving ground initiatives. Um, I figured that this would be a nice segue to how the uh, NOAA National Centers, um, the NOAA National Centers are using the data as well as the individual weather forecast offices. And so here we have the first three, you can see they're highlighted here. Um, I had actually taken these from Bill Schober. Um, the river ice and flooding, fire and smoke, and the NOAA unique CRIS ATMS processing system, also known as UCAPS. But as you can see here, some of these other initiatives that I can't go on um, so that we can save some time here. And I'm trying to read, Bernie, your message here. So I'm going to move first to the river ice and flooding initiative. As you can see here, uh, the initiative began in November 2013. It was uh, the initial objectives that you can see listed here for new river and ice flooding products, something that is uh, pretty important, especially for areas up in Alaska but also uh, the Western US, which has dealt with some major uh, floods in the past. Ice jams, also something very uh, important that we have to deal with pretty routinely, especially the last couple of winters. And then implement procedures to transition these research capabilities to the forecast offices and to operate. Uh, actually, high interest in the uh, river forecast centers, which we have a few of those. They're going to be on the next map, um, next slide here that I'll be able to show you. Uh, but we have been getting some uh, nice, uh, sorry, I'm losing my words here, getting some nice participation uh, from these uh, RFCs to help in, in looking at these products. Um, Bernie, to answer your question, um, um, I'm wondering if uh, Bill Schoberg would know better than me, but I believe there there is talk with the national community for making some of these products available outside of the U.S. But I can double check on that later unless Bill responds. All right. So moving forward here, as you can see now, here we have the river and ice uh, flood initiative for the RFC areas of responsibility. You can see how these areas are much larger than, say, what a, a, a county warning area is what we call them for the National Weather Service here in the U.S. Um, these are much larger areas, include a lot of uh, the tributaries that lead to the larger uh, river systems in the U.S. So these RFCs have a lot to worry about, especially out west with, uh, say, the Missouri Basin out here, Colorado. Um, we've had some unfortunate flooding events um, right in this section of Utah over the past um, couple months, actually, as well as there is even in the southeast. You know, it, it just depends on where the heaviest of rains we've set up. Um, so being able to monitor some of these with the capabilities of the uh, NPP satellite has been really helpful. And here is some examples of some of the flooding. This comes from uh, the Ted Shanks Wildlife Management Area, uh, which underwent a pretty heavy flooding event. Um, as you can see, the area of interest highlighted here is where you saw the flooding that stepped away from the actual river itself. And to answer, uh, to go back to Bernie's question, I see Bill did mention here that uh, there has been talk with UMETSAT 
in November, and these products can be made available to anyone with the DB antenna. And the river ice and flooding is in the CSPP package. And then here's an ice jam example from Hannibal, Missouri that occurred last year um, during one of our uh, particularly strong cold outbreaks in the US. As you can see here, the area highlighted here by the arrow, and this is what it looked like on the river. So obviously those could be very important for people who might be in the path of the floodwaters. Now moving on to the fire and smoke initiative. This one began back in May, 2014. Uh, the initial objectives listed here, evaluate the current use of geostationary and pole orbiting satellite capabilities for the fire and smoke detection and forecast mission, but also identify a current SNPP, GPSS, and new GOZAR data capabilities with the potential to improve the support to this system or to this mission rather, establish the methodology and procedures needed, and then identify the satellite capabilities. The focus started on Western region high risk fire areas. That's where we're gonna get a lot of our larger fires in the US and include APSF and GOZAR program capabilities for this initiative. So you can see here on this next slide, how the weather forecast offices from the National Weather Service are currently using the satellite imagery they will use some of these different products, you know, listed here, especially in this case, you know, as you can see, but the title up here, where is the smoke? Is there a fire? And it turns out a lot of the smoke was originating over Northwest Canada. We've had quite a few of those events over the last couple of years, even getting smoke as far east as here in the uh, DC area. Um, so the idea was to highlight how we could use uh, some of the new MPP capabilities to help the uh, offices identify the smoke, also uh, help the satellite analysis branch, uh, which is one of the centers that I work with. It's a division of NESDIS, um, and they actually use the data to locate where not only fires exist, but also where the smoke plumes are currently, and even just a short forecast for where they may go. And speaking of forecasts, this next slide shows the high resolution rapid refresh. We call it the HER mode product. You can see a couple of forecasts here that are issued that take some of the information from the satellite and then the model pushes it forward in time to give you an idea of the dispersion. And now this next image here is an animation. So it won't let me mark here on the image, but if you were to look at the upper part of the image and then look here, I don't know if you can see where the California Nevada border come together, the fire is actually northwest, or I'm sorry, northeast of the large lake area that would be the Sacramento, California area. And the King fire in this case was just to the west, northwest of that, um, closer to Yosemite National Park. All right, the final initiative that I'm gonna go over here is the NOAA Unique CRIS ATMS Processing System, the New CAPS Initiative. This uh, began back in July of 2014. And this has been, I think, one uh, from the National Weather Service perspective, and I hope Bill Schoberg won't mind my opinion being put out here, but I think this has grown into a pretty successful initiative in that we're identifying different ways that we can use these soundings and not just in place of uh, getting regular radio sound information, but as a complement to our current radio sound network. And the fact that you know, what you're getting in this, these products could actually not just from the forwarding perspective, but also in the hind casting, if you're trying to figure out why something happened so that you can be ahead of the curve uh, the next time that particular event occurs. Um, it kind of gives you a, a different perspective of the atmosphere in a much larger area than just one radio sound or even a drop sound would be able to give you. So the new CAPS program objectives are generating the spectral and spatially thin radiances, uh, provide a retrieve products such as the profiles, temperature, and moisture. That has been of interest to a lot of the forecasts I've talked to, and provide global validation.
foundation products for uh, such as the radio sound matchups and gridded radiance and profiles. Uh, the initiative objective to improve the operational use of SMPP were those NWS offices with AWIPS 2. So we actually have the capability in AWIPS 2 that if you were to click, I'm going to show this towards the end of the presentation. I probably should have moved the, those slides up. You can actually click on the screen and it'll open up a sounding uh, over whatever location the uh, satellite uh, footprint went over. I think that that's a pretty exciting way to look at it. Um, but also, as Bill's reminding me here, doing horizontal and vertical cross sections is another thing that's been requested, um, especially for some of the side products that are growing from this new CAPS initiative. So I will move on to an example here. As you can see, the sounding comparisons during the cow water experiment, this occurred back in February 2014. Uh, I believe it was a couple month experiment where they were trying to look at atmospheric rivers and we were trying to compare what new caps had to offer as well as what aircraft was able to collect um, so that they can better study these atmospheric river events. And you can see there's a lot of squiggly lines in here, but the idea is that uh, you can compare a model sounding, which would be in the cyan coloring, which, no, that's green. Cyan coloring is in there, I promise you. Anyway, you can compare it to uh, what you get with the GFS, um, but also what you're getting from the retrievals through new caps, which is pretty exciting. And another case where this has been very helpful, um, has been a big topic of late, has been the Alaska Cold Air Aloft project. As you can see here, uh, highlighted in this particular sounding is a minus 65 Fahrenheit um, cold pocket. This causes the aviation fuel to become like gelatin. I'm sure that if you were flying over the pole, over those high latitudes, you would not want your jet liner um, having its fuel become like a gelatin. So uh, this has become a very important project uh, to be uh, used by the Aviation Weather Centers, both up in Alaska, as well as the uh, Aviation Weather Center that Amanda uh, works with, uh, to try to identify these and steer the planes clear of these very cold uh, areas. And as Bill just mentioned here, it could also be um, used for other international applications as this is a worldwide event. It's not just located up in Alaska. So move on to this, I will say one of the final uh, new cap projects that I'm at least uh, closely involved in is identifying the stratospheric intrusions and being able to use new caps to define the ozone as well as uh, the temperature and moisture profiles associated with stratospheric intrusion and how that can lead to uh, explosive cyclogenesis or potential for severe thunderstorm outbreaks things of that sort. So I hope to have some you know, very exciting information to share with people over the next couple of years. So moving on to the actual proving ground work that I'm involved in, as well as many of the other um, satellite liaisons that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Uh, prior to the satellite proving ground coming to a lot of these uh, national centers, uh, in particular, I work with the Ocean Prediction Center, the Weather Prediction Center, the satellite analysis branch of NIST, which I already mentioned, as well as National Hurricane Center. Many of these centers were using mainly scatterometers and altimeters, thanks to our, uh, our, our international partners um, for a lot of the work that they've done. We use the scatterometers, for instance, uh, on MEDOP A and MEDOP B. Um, but since the satellite proving ground has come to fruition, uh, we've been able to start getting some of the NPP VIRS imagery into operations. And one of our successes was making the data available during Hurricane Sandy back in October of 2012. Uh, MODIS imagery has become used a lot more. That is a NASA. Um, it's actually an instrument on two of NASA satellites, the Terra and Aqua satellites. Uh, and then a passive microwave imagery, which both the Hurricane Center and the Satellite Analysis Branch use when they're identifying and classifying tropical cyclones. So we're starting to enhance 
and uh, some of the things that have already been done with the new technology and build upon uh, some of these experiences to allow the foresters to have more material and for uh, hopefully uh, improve their forecast capabilities. So I'm going to give you an idea of just how large of an area the, the United States has as far as its areas of responsibilities. As you can see here, and I will try to use the laser pointer here, all of the weather prediction centers territory would be the continental U.S. They do worry about Puerto Rico. Um, we have Alaska up here as well, and then Hawaii. Uh, the tropical analysis and forecast branch takes care of everything down through the Caribbean. And they also do issue heavy rainfall, um, not really advisories, but heavy rainfall forecasts for Hispaniola uh, as part of the WMO um, objectives. Um, and then uh, just to give you an idea, the ocean prediction covers a lot of this area north of about 30 degrees north, while Hawaii would cover a lot of the area south of that. And then the tropical analysis forecast branch takes care of all this area here for high seas. So very large areas. Um, and I'm sure that you got a bit of an overview over the past couple of days, so I won't belabor this too much more. But instead, I'm going to give you some colorful pictures and nice examples of, of some of the imagery that we've had in our workstations uh, here in College Park, as well as down at the Hurricane Center. You can see in this first image here, the combined Veers Chris RGB air mass. Um, so air mass has been something that's been used more and more over the last few years as the capabilities have been made available to us. Um, and in this case, we were using it to identify the dry air that was getting in on the eastern part of Hurricane Sandy. Um, this was during one of the blizzards, I believe back in 2013 over New England. But we have everything from the day night band to the long wave infrared, short wave IR. So it's pretty exciting. And to get it at 374 meter resolution and also be able to display it at that resolution um, has really wowed a lot of the forecasters. So we go to a day night band example here on the left. You can see this picture here over the conus, identifying areas of fog and low cloud while you do have convection interspersed throughout here. So the forecasters were able to monitor where the convection was and where the instability aloft, since you had a lot of uh, stability at low levels. But even over Alaska, being able to monitor, I don't know if you can see here, but that's Fairbanks. And that little dot right there would be Anchorage. Um, to be able to monitor these storms over the Gulf of Alaska is a pretty exciting um, thing for the forecasters to have now. I thought this is, was a pretty unique way of combining both the GOES-R and the JPSS programs. And sometimes, you know, it, it's kind of funny. We probably all have our moments where we we like to cater to the weather nerd, if you will, inside all of us. I know that I get really excited about some of the uh, weather that we see and then being able to see it in the satellite imagery. But here, one of the forecasters used the 375 meter resolution from Veers uh, to look at this V of convection. So you had a lot of shear loss. But look at what's over uh, laid on top are these uh, overshooting tops. And the overshooting top product actually is born out of the GODAR program, um, but it does use uh, for verification some of the polar orbiters. Here you can actually see the lightning flashes and where they are co-located to the overshooting tops. But as much as it tells you where things are happening, it sometimes can tell you where things may not be happening and where there could be some errors in algorithms. And this little dot down here, south of the Florida Keys, which shows up with the cold cloud top here, was actually at the edge of the uh, anvil or of this cirrus plume from the thunderstorms and was not co-located with any of the lightning. So it does beg the question, was that truly an overshooting top? So just some interesting caveats of, of using the imagery. Here's another animation that was put together by the satellite analysis branch. And I'll let it run now and just shows you a few different Veers dust RGB uh, passes.
And what the fort, the uh, satellite analyst was looking at is an area that's right over the Texas, Oklahoma, so pretty much the center of the screen. So in the center of this screen, you'll see the first signs. Again, I wish I could do the laser pointer on here. It actually won't let me do that. Um, you can see some of the dust starting in the western part of Texas near the Mexico border. Again, it would be kind of the center, lower part of the screen here. You can see on this last image an enhanced area of pinks that are right near the edge of the swath. That would be an area of uh, deep dust uh, that was occurring. Now, typically over the U.S., we probably don't see as many dust storms as you're going to see in other parts of the world, especially, say, if, if you're over in Africa and you have the Saharan Desert right next to you. But some of these dust storms do cause aviation problems. Um, they also cause health issues with the amount of particulate, the amount of aerosol that is looking into the air. So the satellite analysis branch has the job of being able to highlight where these dust storms are occurring. And having the capability of the dust RGB with the higher resolution imagery from Beers has proven to be very useful. This next example here was Hurricane Manuel from 2013. And this was kind of a pride moment for us. It took a long time to get the imagery into the National Hurricane Center. And it turns out the first day that we made available, we had this beautiful shot of Manuel. This actually was right before its second landfall in Mexico. It wound up bouncing off the coast, kind of like this. And then it went back out and then back in again. Um, but a very timely image and the forecasters were very excited that we were able to look at the hurricane with the uh, full moon um, in the middle of the night. So very exciting for their purposes. And here is a passive microwave pass of Super Typhoon Vongfang from last year, actually. And this capability is also now available at the Hurricane Center as well as um, at the satellite analysis branch using the ATMS 88 gigahertz product. So now we have additional ways to really get an idea of the convective organization underneath the clouds. And that's, uh, again, proven to be pretty exciting and useful for the forecasters. So when we go to some of these ozone products, I told you about the initiatives being looking at stratospins, uh, one of the proving ground initiatives that is. Well, in this case, we have some ozone products that help with quantifying to some extent what you're able to see in the air mass RGB product. If you see in the upper left, the system that is uh, Right in the Gulf of Alaska, just about onshore, you can see the high levels of ozone from a total column perspective. Um, these greens, I only, they're going to be over 350 Dobson units. But when you look at the anomaly portion in this circle here, uh, you're above 125% of normal. And so you have this from AIRS, but you also have a product available from CRIMS. Um, and we're looking at ways that we can, again, make some horizontal uh, products available through new caps as well. But the forecasters have been using these ozone products to help put a little bit more information into their hands regarding how strong of a stratosphere intrusion, and then what does that mean for my forecast moving forward. Here's another example, one of the products that you get in our workstations. Uh, we currently use a system called NA Whips. It really is gem pack, if you've never heard of that before. Um, it's gem pack that has been catered to the National Weather Service's needs. And on the left here, you can see a very strong, almost a blob, if you will, of ozone. Some of these uh, numbers were exceeding 450 Dobson units, and here is the MODIS pass at approximately the same time. And you can notice that although you have all these pinks and reds that go out well ahead of the system, much of the ozone was co-located with this gorgeous um, circulation that you see um, right at the edge of the swath here. So it gives you an idea of how you can um, 
put a little bit more information together to create a little more of a, a conceptual model, maybe kind of an on the fly version, but just kind of gives you a little more information about the intensity of the system that you're looking at. All right, and I think we're getting to the last of my animations here, so you'll have to keep going back and forth. But the uh, Arctic imagery, this has been an exciting initiative as well. Um, as I mentioned, when you're up at the higher latitudes, you tend to be on the edge of the geostationary images. So Matt Lazara, who works for SIMS at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, has put a product together where they actually are stitching, uh, for the time being, MODIS passes, and I believe some AVHRR um, from the NOAA birds. I don't know if MEDOP is getting into this, but VIRS is supposed to be added uh, very soon. And what it does is it just gives you a little bit more complete imagery over the pole. So you can actually see systems that would be coming over the pole into the U.S., into Canada. Um, or even into uh, the North Atlantic near Iceland, you know, between Greenland and uh, the rest of Scandinavia. So this product has been on our radar for some time now. It is just getting in front of the forecasters, and we're hoping to get some more feedback pretty soon. Um, they've kind of gotten used to using an eight-kilometer version of the product. This is four kilometer, so it's going to be much more useful for their purposes. And then this product here is what's called a hybrid uh, four kilometer infrared geo Leo blend. So what does that mean? Well, in trying to prepare for Gozar and the resolutions that will be available, this is utilizing Veers and Modus and putting them in animation form. I didn't put a whole animation together here for you. Um, but instead, I put two different slides, and if I go forward, you're going to notice that the resolution of the image changed drastically. So again, I go back. This is the four kilometer from the geostationary uh, goes east, as we call it. And the next image here, you have goes east, but now you've put in this swath at two kilometer resolution. And we thought that, that would be an, in kind of an innovative way of getting polar orbiting data in front of the forecasters. And actually, especially for the Ocean Prediction Center, um, it has been used quite a bit in the past. Um, so we're hoping that these inventive ways would get forecasters more comfortable in looking at polar orbiting data uh, when it comes to imagery, at the very least. So at the Aviation Weather Center, again, I know Amanda gave a talk on Monday, but um, from the polar orbiting side, um, here are some of the products that they wind up using in operations there. You have the nighttime microphysics product um, used at their tropical forecasting domain. The dust product, very useful for a lot of their dust sigmets and dust enhancement that CIRA offers. And I want to be able to, again, go forward and backwards here. If you're looking at this image, could you tell that there's a dust storm going on beneath these clouds? If you're looking at the geostationary, which is going to be at um, one kilometer, there's not really a lot of evidence there. And in this true color image, again, it's kind of blended in the background. You have the clouds overlaid. But you put in the dust enhancement from Sierra, and lo and behold, you have a dust storm underneath. That could be very important for the aircraft that would be landing at any of those local airports. When it comes to assisting in convective forecasts, uh, you can see this is from an actual area forecast discussion from the National Weather Service office in Brownsville, Texas. And you can see that although they were seeing most clear skies, the day night band actually showed them glimpses of showers that well to the south southeast of the Brownsville forecast area. So a use right in their system that was ready for them at, at a timely manner to identify areas that were outside of radar and could give them a little clue as to what might be going into their radar view and over uh, some of their public areas. Identifying fog at night, this was used up in uh, Missoula, Montana. And you can see lots of lighter areas here that are colored. You have a nice cirrus plume that is uh, over from uh, the downstream effect of the mountains. 
but some of these areas you can see kind of these river valleys the fog is showing up you cannot see that on our current four kilometer imagery so being able to get a 750 meter resolution day night band image in a time of matter again really helps in identifying these areas well image that i have here is you know sometimes it isn't always about the weather sometimes it's about what weather has already produced and in this case the snowpack in the northern range of alaska being able to look at that here and here's an actual picture of the time of the image so shows you how well the snow reflectivity can be and how it was captured uh, by veers in this case so now i'm getting towards the end of the presentation here um here's just a couple of glimpses of new caps as it is seen in our awips 2 uh, what's called our D2D mode. We have two different sides. You have a national center's perspective, and then you have a regular AWIP side with the rest of the National Weather Service uses. But as you can see here, the new caps is overlaid on top of the infrared satellite imagery. And so if a forecaster picked on any one of these dots, just like I'm doing here with the laser pointer, this is what the display would be on their system. So you can actually get, although it is rather coarse, it's not going to be like a radio sign, they can get at least an idea of how much dry air is occurring, how, how much uh, is the column cooling at other levels, uh, also identifying areas of higher moisture when needed, and kind of gives you just a poor man's way of looking at the amount of uh, convective available potential energy, you know, if you're, if you're worried about thunderstorm development. So... Kind of an exciting way of looking at that, especially when you you can't get radio sounds every hour. I really think this is where the satellite's uh, going to be proving a lot of its uh, strength. So as a summary, the JPSS um, Proving Ground program has uh, proven its value as it goes into its fifth year of operations. Uh, the project teams have shown that they can respond to the high visibility. And the success of early proven ground initiatives have encouraged creation of ones. As I mentioned, one that wasn't included was the uh, rapid intensification of cyclones and using new caps, for instance. But there are many other projects that are going on nowadays. Uh, the VIT imagery is, has become a bit of a staple of satellite images used for national media. That's pretty exciting. It gets in front of the public, and hopefully it's getting in front of the international community as well. And the uh, SMPP success stories continue to be documented on the JPSS website and in articles and seminars. So uh, please, when you have a moment, uh, take a look at the website. And as you can see as my final slide here, here are some of the ways that you can get more information on the JPSS program, uh, both through the website as well as social media and YouTube. And with that, I think I've done okay on time. Um, I can take any questions if you have any. Thank you very much.